I think her work on advancing policies that create safe and healthy environments where people live, work, play, and travel resonates with a lot of what's been happening at the UHC. And I think many of us know her work from her injury or physical activity focused work. Um, but what she's going to be presenting today is a bit different from that and, and also really well aligned with our focus on, on trying to understand how to bring how to bring evidence into the hands of people who can use it to make a difference in the lives of urban residents. And so understanding how to promote health equity through work with urban policies, I think is very, uh, very core to what we want to know about and are eager to hear some, uh, some of her expertise. Um, Dr. Porter is a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, um, and she directs their Institute for Health and Social Policy. She's also very engaged, you know, not only in her own research program, but also in making sure that that gets translated and making sure that policymakers have access to and, and an appreciation of science that can help inform their work. So thank you so much for being Great. here. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for, for having me. It's great to be here and to see so many familiar faces. And as Gina said, um, uh, there are people here I know through my injury work like Alex or through physical activity built environment like Jana. And then Felicia's here who I know from like my awk work. So this is great. Um, and it's great that I'm talking about something different actually that I don't think any of them have heard me talk about before. So um, I'm thrilled to be here and just want to thank the entire collaborative um, for hosting me and um, I really appreciate everything Serafina did and, and thank you so much Anna for, for having me today. So in our, in our time together, I'm going to begin by talking about why I believe we should consider health and health equity in non-health policies. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, but I'm still going to share my thoughts and make sure we're all on the same page as we move forward. I'm then going to talk about how health and all policies is, is one way to really operationalize how we can consider health in non-health policies with a sp particular focus on health impact assessments, HIAs. How many people are familiar with health impact assessments? Okay, great. So I'm going to talk through a local example in Baltimore. I didn't lead that HIA, but I was um, consulted in terms of the policy parts of that HIA. And then I'm going to talk about a new tool we've been working on because HIA is not always the right thing for every decision. And so we have created a new tool called a health note, and I'll talk about that and, and why, what we're doing with this health note for legislatures um, at the state and also at the local level. And then I'll just conclude with some thoughts about how we can really continue to promote um, health equity and urban policies and the kinds of things I think are important to think about. I love this slide from, from Dick Jackson that always reminds us that most of our health is dictated by where we live what surrounds us all the time, and that's the homes we live in, the foods we eat, how we travel, the schools we attend, our access to parks and playgrounds. Just as a reminder that where we live, learn, work, play, and pray all affect our health. Similarly, this image from the World Health Organization that I'm sure all of you have seen at some point reminds us that health is is driven by a number of factors. So our individual host factors are just a small part of, of the context that we live in, where social, economic, and political factors such as segregation, inequality, poverty, racism, all affect our health. With that in mind, when we think about inequities, we can rely on a wealth of literature. And I just have some points up here that are dated back to the early 90s from Whitehead and saying, well, if we think about the fact that all of these things contribute to health, and we know that there are systematic differences that have driven a lot of our health outcomes and these differences in these social, economic, and political factors, we can then say that inequities in health are a consequence of health, quote unquote, health damaging behaviors where our degree of choice of lifestyle is severely restricted. So you talk for all of you in the community, I'm sure you've heard people say, well, you know, go eat well. Well, you know what, if you don't have access to a healthy, affordable, quality, high quality foods, you're not able to always embrace that uh, or make changes in your life that align with that suggestion. We also know that exposure to unhealthy, stressful living and working conditions are important place matters. 
have been involved in research where we've looked at place, where we've looked at individuals living in communities and the impacts on health and health determinants. We also know that inadequate access to health care and other essential services like transportation really matter when we think about health outcomes. And as I mentioned earlier, these systematic differences in policy practices and factors affect our health. And I'm sure you've seen some variation of this image to remind all of us that, that equality isn't the same as equity. And when we think about promoting equity in policies, it is critical to remember that not everybody starts off at the same place. And because of that, we have to think about those underlying contextual factors that we need to consider before we can just go ahead and implement a policy. In the policy literature, there's been a real drive for equity, considering equity more in policies. And what does that mean? What does that mean if we're implementing a housing policy where one community has been disproportionately affected by housing policies for 30, 40, 50 years, a policy that we want to put forward is not going to affect everybody in the same way. So if we think back to what I've said just a few minutes ago about the importance of factors and these broad factors affecting health, some of us in health would say that this causes a problem. The problem being that policy decisions made in these other sectors have significant health implications that often go unrecognized. And so what I'm saying is that our transit systems, our housing systems, our IT systems, our, our legal systems, our healthcare systems, our neighborhoods, our schools, all affect health. Now as health people, we're in this sphere right here, but if all of these things affect health, how do we work with all of these sectors? How do we work with all of these stakeholders in a way where we can help them systematically think about health when they're making decisions. And I'm not saying that in, in order to promote that we should be paternalistic when we think about this. And I remember giving a talk one time and somebody said, oh, you health people want everybody to do health. I said, no, I don't want everybody to do health. I want you to think about the health impacts before you make your decision. And that takes us to health and all policies. Some people think that health in all policies is sort of a buzzword, and, and it can be when it's not really implemented. There's certainly been lots of studies talking about health in all policies, but what we mean by this, and it's the acronym is HIAP, so if you hear me say HIAP, that's health in all policies. This is a collaborative approach. It's a different way of doing business, essentially. It's systems level change to say, we are going to consider health, we're going to consider equity, in decisions that were made at all levels of government programming across all sectors. HIAP requires public health professionals to connect with other sectors. Because if I just said that all of these agencies and sectors make decisions affecting health, we have to work with them in a meaningful way. We have to have partnerships in order to really then advance health. If, if, that, if you all believe that these sectors contribute to health and health determinants, we have to work with them. So HIAP, again, is a systems level change, and there have been a number of documents out there to help support the practice of HIAP. This is a document I, I, uh, that NATO put out a couple of years ago to say, well, for state and local governments, this is how you, do, this is how you sort of do HIAP. HIAP has some key elements. One is to promote health, equity, and sustainability considerations. So again, when we think about how decisions made in other sectors affect health, we have to think about, are there groups that are disproportionately affected? What do we know about the underlying contextual issues that matter? What about the underlying political, social, economic factors? HIAP supports interagency or intersectoral collaborations. Maryland, uh, as a state, passed a, a bill last year creating a HIAP work group that I sat on. And that work group included representatives from every state agency and a number of experts like myself as we were thinking through how they could better consider health in their decision making. HIAP also recognizes co-benefits from multiple partners. It's finding those win-wins. So it's not saying to the transportation engineers, you should consider health because it's the right thing to do. It's to say you should consider health and safety because it helps your transportation systems be more efficient, which is a goal. So understanding the goals of these various sectors and how they can come together is central to HIAP. Health and All Policies also engages a broad array of stakeholders from the community members themselves, to decision makers, to the private sector, 
So again, a number of stakeholders are involved in these initiatives. I mentioned earlier, HIAP is really about systems level changes. So we're talking about changing the way agencies do their business. So creating structures or processes, and I'll give you a few examples in a moment. And finally, accountability. Holding these agencies then accountable when we implement HIAP initiatives. Holding our health departments, holding our, our colleagues in other sectors accountable for the decisions, ensuring that they're considering health and equity in what they're doing. <clears throat> When I, I'll talk a little bit later about the we, but when I say we, I'm talking about my colleagues at the Health Impact Project, and I'll tell you more about who that is in a moment. Um, we contracted with Temple School of Law to do a legal review of all bills in this country related to HIAP and health impact assessment. Um, that paper's under review right now, but basically we found out that between 2012 and 2016, there were 28 bills introduced in 13 jurisdictions around HIAP. So we're seeing states really pushing forward in terms of health and all policy initiatives. Most of these related to a new work group or task force or something to bring people together. We also saw that there were 19 laws that were enacted or amended in these states. So again, they were proposed, these 28 bills. We had 19 laws that we sort of saw some movement. The most popular people tend to point to is California which when Governor Schwarzenegger was in office, he created the first ever state level HIAP uh, work group. There's actually, it's been evaluated, uh, that we've seen improvements in how state agencies work together and consider health. Um, so it's really a model for other states that are moving forward. And because this went through 2016, um, our bill that was passed in Maryland isn't on this map. So as we think about HIAP, I'll say there's really no one way to quote unquote do HIAP. There are a number of ways where you can advance health and all policies, a number of strategies. And here are just a few. You know, creating cross go sector government uh, agencies. In Baltimore several years ago, our health commissioner created what's called a CAT team, C-A-H-T, and that's the Cross Agency Health Task Force. So that was our, our prior health commissioner saying, we need to bring agencies together to think about health. So she codified this CAT team. We also see health being included in zoning processes and zoning updates, and I'll give an example of this when I talk about HIA. <laughs> We've seen specific integration of health language in RFPs. For example, in Baltimore, we just um, got bike share last year. In the RFP for the vendor to run bike share, there was language about health in that proposal that the vendor had to respond to. We've seen health-related grant scoring criteria for planning proposals, workforce development around these, these concepts, and finally, the use of health impact assessment and other related tools, which I'll focus on today as a way to really advance health in all policies. A number of you said you're familiar with HIA. I just wanted to show you a definition from the National Research Council's report that was published in 2011. And there's a number of definitions, but they all sort of say the same thing. HIAs are a structured process that involves scientific data, professional input, stakeholder engagement, to identify the potential health impacts of a decision. So this is not evaluation. The decision's not already made. It's the situation where a decision is proposed. We systematically look at the ways health can be advance in a positive way, and health can be harmed. And we identify those recommendations that will help to magnify and promote positive health and minimize those, those harms. I won't go through all the steps of HIA, but I wanted to let you know that there, it's a systematic process. So there are various steps. Um, I'll just briefly mention them. So HIAs begin with screening, where you ask, are we going to do an HIA or not? During the scoping phase, you're essentially outlining the scope of the HIA, what are the health issues you're going to, to cover. In the assessment phase, we're doing what's called a baseline assessment to say, where is the health of the community now? How are the health determinants in that community now? And we're proposing and projecting, hypothesizing, what could happen if that decision goes forward. Again, to highlight positive ways health will be improved and to, min and to identify potential health harms. After we complete our assessment, we are coming up with recommendations to say, here's how you can improve health. 
Here's how you can improve equity, because equity is also in the background, and I'll talk more about how equity fits in these steps in a moment. We then report and communicate, and then there's monitoring and evaluation in terms of the HIA process, what happened to that proposal, et cetera. Stakeholder engagement is across the top because it's present in every single step. This is really what makes HIA different from something like an environmental impact assessment, for those of you familiar with EIAs. The level of stakeholder engagement we see in an HIA is, is very different from that, that we'll see in an environmental impact assessment, where there are processes where I've worked with communities at the screening step to say, let's think about what are some decisions coming up that could benefit from a health analysis. We involve stakeholders, and again, this is the community, it's the policymakers, a variety of stakeholders, all of them we're interacting with. Getting information on the scope of an HIA. Yes, sir. Just curious. Yep. Um, the HIA, is it on par at all with the, um, the community health and um, the screening stuff that the uh, hospitals have to do under the um, HIA? Yeah, great question. So you're referring to the requirement that nonprofit hospitals have to do a community health needs assessment and develop a community health improvement plan. There's actually in the pr practice of HIA a work group of people who are trying to figure out how do we integrate HIA with that process. And what we're seeing is at the point where hospitals are coming up with their community health improvement plan, people are saying we should do HIAs on some of those proposals before they're implemented. So we're starting to see that there's um, a group of folks in Colorado that are really pushing this forward. Good question, thank you. And just in terms of the scoping and the community, one example is there was an HIA that my friend led in Alaska looking at the potential health impacts of a, a drilling company coming in to, to do some drilling. And when they engaged the community in the scoping phase and asked, you know, what do you care about? What are your health concerns? Some of the community residents in this rural part of Alaska said, well, we really care about the impacts of this company coming in on sexually transmitted diseases. The HIA team was kind of like, huh? They didn't see that connection, but the people who live in that community said, well, you have all these folks coming from the outside into our community. There's gonna be sexual activity. What does that mean for us when we've been very isolated to this point? So that's just an example of how the community was involved in the scoping and elevated a health concern while they were figuring out the scope of the assessment that would not have come up on the HIA, from the HIA team alone. I've been involved in HIAs where community members actually helped us collect data. We did an HIA in Baltimore of a proposal to close down a number of city pools in the summertime. And we had young people come out and do surveys with us at the pools, asking questions around use of the pools. Do people know how to swim? So they were there with their clipboards uh, getting surveys filled out for us in the summertime. We also can involve stakeholders at the recommendations phase, and we know from evaluation work of HIA that I've led and others, that for policymakers especially, when you involve them here, your recommendations are more likely to be adopted. It makes sense, right? They can help you think of how to craft feasible, pragmatic recommendations. I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about this, this HIA in Baltimore. Um, and I'll, I'll refer to some of these steps as we go through the process, but I want to give you an example of how HIA was used to raise questions around health impacts, uh, questions around disparities and inequities related to zoning in Baltimore. And this is the Transform Baltimore HIA that was led by my colleague Rachel Thornton and funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's publicly available and I'll talk about a piece of it. Um, so you can uh, search online and find this. But basically, the goal was to say, how do we think about this, this zoning and, and how land is used as a way to improve health? And I'll tell you, I'll, actually, I'll come back to in a second. So just to give you a little bit of background, in Baltimore, our comprehensive plan for the city said we need to you know, update the zoning code. The last time the zoning code was written was in 1971. And you might say to yourself, life cities have changed a lot, right? So when they came along um, uh, and started to redo the process, it wasn't until 2007 where the discussion started to arise in terms of thinking about the zoning policies for Baltimore. And just in terms of timeline, and I'll talk a bit more about this, the first draft was released in, in 2010. 
So if we think back to this, HO, this HIA, which started in 2009, the goal was to try to come up with something that would help to inform the discourse around that first draft that was coming out. So again, the goal of this HIA was to say, let's look at the draft code and see how health can be improved and how we can mitigate negative health consequences. And then again, inform the, the, the zoning code rewrite process. So in terms of policy and figuring out when you want to, when you sort of think about those policy windows being open, where you can actually influence the process. Here's just a timeline of, of the zoning process. And I, and I mentioned this to say, when we think about HIAs as a more of a translational tool and we want to inform decision makers, we have to understand that policy timeline to know when we can insert our information to inform the debate. So for this particular HIA, the initial timeline assumed that, that there was going to be this final ordinance released in 2011. Again, the process started several years before. There were a number of hearings. I mean, as you can imagine, it's a long process to rewrite a whole city zoning code. There were two draft codes released, and then ultimately the HIA um, was, was going along, and then there were different points where they were interacting with the team with stakeholders to then inform this particular process. I'll tell you just a little bit about Baltimore for those of you who haven't been there, just to give you a sense of the significant uh, disparities. This is just one metric where we see life expectancy varies substantially by neighborhood. So if for those of you in the back who can't see these numbers here, the darker parts of the map are where life expectancy is higher, between 73.7 and 82.9. The lighter areas are where they're lowest. In Baltimore, this area right here, this is where um, the Freddie Gray incident occurred, if, you, if you're familiar with that, and the life expectancy in that community, 62.5 years. And just if you head about three miles up the road, we're talking about 82 years of age. I'm sure that there are similar people, so there's a similar day like this in Philadelphia, so this is not, should not be surprising. But one of the things that I think this allowed folks to think about was if we already have these significant differences, we, which we know are being driven by where people live, work, learn, and play. Is there an opportunity in the zoning code to infuse something that might help to address some of these inequities? Yeah. I'm just curious. Um, when that map, where um, Hopkins is? Hopkins. So, yep, so this is uh, in downtown in a harbor. And so Hopkins is, most of Hopkins is over here. I mean, we're not, we're sort of, yeah, I mean, we're not up in the 80s. So Hopkins is over here. So life expectancy in East Baltimore is, is equal to sort of the west side. People, if you look at all of our, for Baltimore, people talk about the butterfly effect in Baltimore. I could show you a map like this for a number of indicators, and you're going to see the worst um, measures east and west. The best downtown at the harbor and up north, where these are the most affluent areas in the city. And so for this HIA, what the team did was said, we're going to use expert opinion, literature reviews, and quantitative assessments to, again, look at and inform decision makers about the, co the potential of the rezoning code to inform healthy communities, decrease disparities, address inequities. And then again, provide some recommendations on, on that. So here's just a little bit of the methods. I won't go into this too much. This is a very comprehensive HIA. It took a long time to do. I'm only going to focus on one finding, um, just in the interest of time. Uh, but they used a number of, of qualitative and quantitative methods. They, engaged stakeholders, um, they looked at differences in terms of inequities in the community by a number of indicators, and the one that I'm going to talk about relates to um, crime, essentially. This was the, the broad framework. If you work on an HIA, you have very specific and detailed analytical models, but their broad conceptual model said zoning will impact the built environment, which could have impacts on crime, pedestrian safety and physical activity, food access, so diet and nutrition, which could impact obesity and related illnesses. Again, this is just a very simplistic um, illustration of their broader model, but this essentially is, was what they were saying. So they're saying to policymakers, we affect our built environment, we might see some impacts on crime or some of these other health determinants. And it was this, this impact on crime that, that really got a lot of attention because going through the literature, talking to stakeholders, the connection between crime and alcohol outlets was incredibly prevalent in all of those discussions. And 
When you talk to city council members, what do they care about? The crime rates in their own communities, right? So if you think about that map I showed you earlier, there are districts of city in the city council where they're responsible for where the crime rates were really, really high. And there was also this issue about liquor stores being in residential districts. So that 1971 zoning code limited the number of liquor stores that should be in residential areas. Specifically, it said that there should be one liquor license for every 1,000 residents or so in an area. So you might expect to you know, see some sort of, uh, actually this should be 665, no, I'm seeing that, I will fix that. Um, but really there were more than double. So in the city, there were about 1,300 liquor stores, and this is a map showing you the liquor stores that were sort of defined as non-conforming. And they're non-conforming because they shouldn't be where they are, according to the zoning code. So this is just another map of Baltimore. This is downtown, and what this is showing is in red, these dots here, are all of the non-conforming alcohol outlets. The colors show median home sale prices. <laughs> the lighter colors are, between, are under 48,000, all the way to the darker colors up to 670,000. So very affluent area of Baltimore. And what are we seeing? A lot of concentrated outlets in the west side of Baltimore, a lot over here in the east side. And again, the zoning code says that there should not be this many here. At the time, there was some attention on these alcohol outlets, but really what was significant about this HIA is that it highlighted and for the first time mapped these data in a way that city council members could look at what was happening in their district to say, my residents are being disproportionately impacted by where alcohol outlets are going. And we know about all the connections between alcohol and crime, I mean, that was focused on here, but there are many other conditions that alcohol is connected to that, that led to significant uh, disparities in outcomes. So part of what this HIA ended up doing was that it elevated the attention on how zoning policy could be one way to decrease the crime because the data also showed if you look at the maps of the alcohol outlets and violent crimes, they were totally overlaid. So where you had alcohol outlets, you saw homicides, you saw gun-related violence. And so as people were thinking through the increases in homicide in Baltimore, <coughs> here was another factor. So it wasn't just about people recidivism or access to firearms. It's about the fact that people live in communities where they had alcohol outlets that, that had a number of other behaviors and illegal activity that was attracted to it. Through their work, they interviewed um, families and looked at data, and you saw stories about, I took that slide out, sorry. You saw stories about kids saying that, you know, they saw, they would walk by the alcohol outlet on the way to school. They would see drug activity. Um, they talked about all the other types of activities that were happening at the alcohol outlets. And so there was this increased focus on alcohol sales outlet distribution. In regards to that focus on crime, there was also uh, increased focus on crime prevention through environmental design, or SEPTED, if people have heard of that before. And this is where there were suggested changes to the built environment around lighting and landscaping. Again, things that we know from the literature to help to reduce crime. And this all came out of that increased focus on alcohol outlets and alcohol sales, which Rachel and her team have actually continued to work on till today. So just I'll fast forward that story. Again, there's a lot more I could tell you about that HIA, but we don't have time. But I'll just say that um, just in 2016, the city council and the mayor finally you know, signed our zoning code um, that went into effect in, in June. And the success of that was that there was so much advocacy and the advocates used the data from that HIA. Um, so for example, like this particular map is from one of our advocacy organizations in Baltimore who got involved um, uh, in, the, in the process to say, this is the Citizens Planning and Housing uh, Association, I think is what, the, what that stands for, who got involved in this HIA to say, we care about our communities and we're gonna use the data. And so many of their materials said, research by the team at Hopkins found this. And it was the fact that we had data to help inform the discourse around these outlets that were significantly tied to health outcomes. So there was a real success here because the zoning code does limit alcohol outlets in residential areas. I will say that the, there was a provision that was added through an amendment 
to focus on additional enforcement of the problem liquor stores. So ones where you know they're selling to, selling to minors, um, that there's other activities going on. And ultimately, this failed. The city council person who um, proposed this is still working on this. But he had hoped to have had something in the zoning code targeting these outlets as well. Again, recognizing that in historically disadvantaged communities, that there was particular targeting and marketing of alcohol, that alcohol outlets were intentionally placed in certain areas. If you look at that map I showed you, they weren't in those communities where homes were $800,000, right? They weren't there. And so as you think about where were the alcohol outlets, they were disproportionately located in the communities that were already lacking resources. So as we think about that in terms of the equity issues, there was increased focus, again, that really came out of this HIA. And we look at this as a real success in terms of elevating this issue to people who didn't really care about zoning, policymakers who weren't thinking about zoning at all, but were focused on crime. But because of the connections between crime and alcohol outlets, they were able to really bring in that alcohol outlet focus into the zoning policy. Yeah. Sheldon. Yeah, great question. So there, there certainly is, has been continued discussion about how to do that. I have a colleague um, who continues to work with this particular city councilman um, trying to figure out what do we need to do. So they're looking at can they close down some of those stores that have been non-conforming. Um, that's one of the, the big focuses, just really closing them down. I mean, that's really been an emphasis. Of course, you can imagine the liquor lobby has been huge in these debates. That's part of the reason why that provision failed. Um, so if you think about uh, big lobbying arms were, were coming out when, these, uh, when the zoning code was being written, there were tons of stories on NPR. Um, but I would say that this increased attention to those outlets in a way that hadn't been done before, that people are talking about closing them now. And then even community residents who I think sort of knew that they were there but didn't realize the magnitude. I remember being in a particular area in West Baltimore uh, talking to somebody who said, you know, we knew they were there, but didn't realize how many were really there, right? And so I think that that also helped people to sort of speak up a bit more. And you're seeing more and more um, community members at city council meetings when they're talking about these issues. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take, I'll, I'll just go back here and then um, yeah, um, I'll go and come back. Yeah. Question. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So I, I don't have the data in front of me. What I would say from the outlets that I saw, they were not community members owning out, uh, alcohol outlets in their community. They were people mostly who, um, uh, you know, who weren't the folks who grew up in Baltimore and had been in that neighborhood and had roots there um, who were uh, op operating these stores. Yeah, all right. So let me, let me just um, say one more thing about this and, and, and transition a little bit. I mentioned that this HIA, this whole zoning process took a long time. It was very comprehensive. And I'll say that, that HIAs are not always the right tool, particularly for policy. And that was one of the reasons why we and the collective we, as my, my colleagues and I at the Health Impact Project, um, have really been working on uh, what we're calling a health note. And I'll say the idea for a health note came, um, well, I had the privilege of working on staff for a state legislature. So when I was a doctoral student, um, I thought it was important to get hands-on experience while I was working on policy, so I volunteered on staff for a policymaker. And then when I joined the faculty, I continued to be on his staff, um, providing support, public health policy support, legislative support, um, during the general se uh, session, general assembly in Maryland. And for all these bills in Maryland, they would have a fiscal note that would say, here are the fiscal impacts on the state of this bill. And I kept thinking, well, there are all these bills here that have health impacts, but there's really no systematic way to look at that. There's a group of people there who analyze health bills, but there was no systematic analysis of these non-health bills. And so I'm really supportive of that uh, through the, my colleagues at the Health Impacts Project, who I've been working with since 2014, when I mentioned this idea, it, we got traction, and RWJF um, became very interested in it. They, they fund, partially fund the Health Impacts Project. And then we've, we've moved on and are now hopefully about to pilot health notes in three states in one city um, this legislative session. And I'll talk a bit more about this 
and what that is. Let me just say the Health Impact Project, in case you're unfamiliar with them, we're located in DC, is a collaboration of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Pew Charitable Trust. We sit at Pew. And our goal is to focus on reducing health inequities and improving the health of all people by ensuring that health is valued and is routinely considered in decisions affecting them. So that's, that's our mission. We do that through a number of ways. I'll just sort of highlight that we have at the Health Impact Project helped support the practice of HIA. In this country, there have been over 400 HIAs that have been completed or in progress. My colleagues and I at the Health Impact Project have, have led and done several of those. The Health Impact Project has also funded a number of HIAs. Uh, we as a team have completed them in five federal level decisions, ranging from housing to food policy, um, a number of areas. We also provide technical assistance. Um, so I get calls from communities who are doing HIAs to help think through, particularly ones around policy. And then we've had a number of professional meetings, I think three national HIA meetings that have had over 400 people attend each of them. And so in terms of the health note, the concept is you know, to think about HIA, you know, the steps we talked about earlier, that are really too many when you have a very short time frame. So the Maryland General Assembly, for example, is 90 days long. And in that time, all of the bills need to cross over, switch chambers, by around day 60. So you don't have a lot of time to do a comprehensive HIA. So we streamline the HIA process, and our goal is to provide and produce a brief, objective, nonpartisan summary of the potential positive and negative health impacts of a bill. Again, bills that are not coming out to the Health Committee, so the Transportation Committee, the Housing Committee, energy bills, whatever they're coming through, we developed this process to help policymakers identify the potential and often overlooked health consequences of these other bills and these other sectors. When we developed the health note, we spent a lot of time doing formative work. We initially focused just on states um, because of some work we had done with states before. But we have actually had a number of cities call us and say, this is the exact kind of thing we can use at the city council level. In our process, we um, begin by screening, and we screen bills. And one of our screening criteria, two of our screening criteria, one is, are there significant determinants of health that will be affected by the bill? And two, are there potential for disproportionate impacts for populations? So we're thinking about uh, potential impacts on equity and thinking about potential impacts on, on health disparities. We also partnered with the National Conference of State Legislatures and looked at all states that had HIA legislation on the books. We reviewed fiscal notes. We did lots of interviews with national leaders. We also interviewed something that's very similar and that Washington <coughs> State has, which is called a Health Impact Review. And um, HIRs have this formal uh, request form. And any, the governor or any legislator can ask for an analysis that has to be completed in about 14 days of how that bill would impact health. So we reviewed all of their HIRs and did a number of interviews. Um, and uh, we have a paper under review on this. But basically, out of this work, we learned a number of things that we need to incorporate for our health note process. One is that buy-in is key, especially from leadership within the body, the General Assembly body. And why that's important is if we think about, as a strategy, how a bill comes out of a committee, it goes to the full body for vote, we want the full body of the legislature to understand and be supportive of this concept. Because our goal is for every time a bill comes forward, you would get a health note and you get your fiscal note. So another piece of information that legislators would consider. We also learned the importance of, pub of partnering with public health agencies. I mentioned earlier, for HIAP, public health agencies are critical. We need their data to analyze those impacts to show how that bill could affect health. There were certainly lots of questions around timing and personnel and our screening criteria. I mentioned equity is central to that screening criteria. We also learned the importance of making sure what we produce is objective and that it's not biased because we want policymakers on both sides of the political aisle to embrace this as an additional source of information. We were also told to omit recommendations, right? So policymakers say, well, tell us the implications, but don't make recommendations on the bill, right? They said, let us do that. Like, that's, that's what we want to do, so give us the information. 
And then we also heard about ensuring that the entity that completes the health note is really key for sustainability. Because our health note that we are um, embarking on, on now, and, and this is just a summary of the website, uh, on our website you can find our fact sheet where we are piloting this in 2018 to help states and localities consider health and policy making. And so we've actually had a number of jurisdictions reach out to us and we've decided to start um, small and we are in the process right now of getting technical assistance letters from the leadership in these jurisdictions and this letter allows us to meet the nonpartisan research and analysis bar for lobbying. Right? So we don't have to get into lobbying, we don't lobby, but if we get this letter it allows us to provide technical assistance to the legislative body around the health note. So we are exploring uh, three states right now where we are very close to getting our letter. And then we've actually had a number of cities, as I said, call us. And so we have one city um, that we're going to be hopefully working with. We have a meeting with the speaker of the city council in New York coming up. And that's the city that we is very interested in piloting this in 2018. Um, I, I, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that we initially said we were going to focus on these bills from a number of sectors except for health. But when we talk to a number of legislators, particularly in states that have also more, um, uh, have rural residents where they're facing hospital closings, they ask that we would you know, think about that area as well because public health is not part of those conversations. The conversation around closing a hospital in an area has really centered on the, the impacts for, for, um, for care and not being able to access care, but the broader impacts around jobs, around um, transportation barriers, those things don't come up. So we've been asked to uh, uh, at least consider our screen bill related to hospital closings. And again, we sort of look at this as a way to not only help policymakers think about how bills could affect health and health determinants, but also to think more broadly around inequities because we're being intentional about thinking through differences not only by race and ethnicity, but also by geography, by gender, by uh, a, uh, socioeconomic status. So a number of factors to say, here's how individuals could be affected, here's how health could be affected if this bill gets passed in its current form. So I'm mindful of the time, I'm gonna stop in a couple minutes because I saw a lot of hands, I'd love to take some questions. Um, I, I wanted to just mention the, our health note work because again, we think that this is a way to really help promote equity considerations through HIAP. And again, we talked a lot today about HIA, and I wanted to just say there are a few ways that I think we can be doing this better in our field. Um, but as far as HIAP and HIA, we're seeing how they promote a, a unifying framework around health and well-being. I talked to policymakers who are now talking about things like social determinants of health, and who about a year ago would, couldn't even told you what that meant, right? And, and it's actually really impressive to hear somebody say, or I get, phone calls and somebody's like, Keisha, I think we can do a health impact assessment of that. Or what do you think about the health implications of this thing? So HIA is growing as a practice. There's still a lot of people who don't know about HIA and HIAP, but I do think that there's a lot of potential. I also think that HIAP and HIA can help to provide robust research and research informed recommendations. So again, a really translational research tool to say, here's what the science says, Here's what it means for this particular decision. There are many examples across the country where we've seen, uh, through HIA in particular, communities being part of the process, learning about research, having a voice and the data that they need to then be advocates for whatever decision is, is being made. And then we've also seen how HIAs can foster accountability because the HIA analysis We'll talk about potential impacts on communities, disproportionate impacts, and you now have something you could hold up to policymakers and say, this is going to happen. How do we stop this from happening? There is a debate within the HIA fields where there has been a growing um, uh, a call for more equity-focused HIAs. And, um, and there are actually people that, that do equity-focused health impact assessments. I, I truly believe, you know, every HIA should include equity, so I, I'm actually not supportive of a separate HIA that emphasizes equity, but I will say that there are certainly opportunities where we have seen, particularly at the World Health Organization, you sort of see this more. Like in the U.S., we have HIA practice 
internationally, we, we hear people talking about equity-focused HIAs. As a practice, I think every HIA should include a focus on equity. Um, so that's what I'm, that's my perspective. Um, but we have seen people thinking through more about how we target age, socioeconomic status, culture and ethnicity, um, really when we think about HIA practice. And there are some equity tools for a HIA. There's a professional society called SOFIA for a health impact assessment, and they have equity assessment tools where every process, every step of the HIA process, you can measure how well you're doing in thinking about equity. So there are metrics that have been identified. You can go onto the website for SOFIA and download those, and then they'll talk to you about how do you approach that in the screening process? How do you approach the equity in the scoping process? giving you tips and very concrete things that you need to do. There's also been, I want to just mention, there is actually um, another tool called a race equity impact assessment. There's a number of in, uh, impact assessments around the world, but there are, um, uh, there's a, a sort of a development to say when you want to highlight racial and ethnic differences and decisions around health, you might use this frame that really amplifies these racial and ethnic differences. And so you would do a race equity impact assessment. So this race equity impact assessment might not include health, right? But it's saying how might other things impact uh, or further exacerbate differences by race and, eth and equity. So these decisions, again, might not always highlight health, but it might include other things like access to education or other types of factors. So as we sort of wrap up, I just wanted to, to share some final thoughts on considering equity in urban, in urban policies and just leave you with a few questions. Um, and again, I, I like to raise these when I talk to people about HIA and, and HIAP. You know, who are your partners? You know, who are you working with? Is the does the community have a, a, a space at the table? Have you involved the other sectors that are making decisions that are going to disproportionately impact people's lives or that are responsible for the health determinants? You know, I would like to ask, who has the control? Who has the power when we think about um, making decisions? You know, I think it's great practice for an HIA to do a power analysis up front so that you know who is holding the decision, who has the power to make the decision that you're looking at. What value is placed on public input and their priorities? Stakeholder engagement is a really important aspect of HIA, and that means talking to people through interviews, focus groups, and that's data. That's their real ex lived experience. I know people that don't equate that to the same level as quantitative data. Qualitative data are critical. And so a lot of HIAs will include both methods and place value, equal value, on the voice of the community. And also, what's the goal when we're engaging with other people? Is it really to inform or consult or involve? Or do we really want authentic engagement, where we're building relationships, where we are elevating considerations of individuals who have historically been left behind? And finally, I'll just say, it's just, and I, it goes without saying, but I always say it, you know, it's so important to work with communities and not thinking about working on affected communities. Um, and that means understanding their perspectives, what matters to them. I have certainly been um, at a screening session for an HIA where we're talking about topics and communities are saying, that's great, but we want to, we care about jobs and we care about schools. Um, and so ultimately, <coughs> We have to think about how do we connect with individuals and really elevating them and, ele and amplifying them to think through how the areas they care about connect with the areas that we care about in terms of health. So let me stop there. And here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me after today if you want to talk more about any of these issues. And um, we have some time for questions. I know there were some hands. So thank you. Great question. So I am go. I think that that. So generally, I'll say two answers. One, generally, HIAs do include psychosocial impacts, right? It would also include the perspectives from the business owners 
who in that situation would be asked to remove the plexiglass and understanding what that means for them as well. I cannot remember the exact metric from this HIA that was done in 2012, um, but I can certainly look it up and we can look online and figure out. But I do know that it came up in the screen and I can't remember if it was ultimately in the final analysis. But certainly those psychosocial impacts are part of many HIAs. Yeah, yes ma'am. Yeah, great question. So part of our, and the, for those in the back, the question was about uh, bills that don't go anywhere. What happen, how do we prioritize those? So in the process of screening, we, we also asked, you know, are there available data um, to actually do uh, an objective analysis? Um, we ask um, the decision makers in terms of leadership broadly about bills that have um, uh, sort of seem to have traction. We also do a legislative history to see if the bills have been introduced in prior sessions, to see if uh, what the discourse was in terms of pulling out prior um, committee hearings and, and see who testified for and against the bill. So we try to understand the policy context to the best of our ability. And then we talk to other advocates who are in the area. Like so for example, people in, you know, in X state that are really involved in the, in the legislature, what are they telling us about things that are moving? So ultimately, we look at, I think there's about eight different criteria that we look at in a matrix and decide which way to go. My second question um, is moving this pilot program forward, looking at sustainability. Yeah. Who's responsible yep. for the localities that are? Great question. So the first year, and thank you for that because I didn't talk about that, uh, we at the Health Impact Project are going to be doing the health notes. We then have money, we're going to give small grants to one jurisdiction, one organization in each jurisdiction, train the trainer for them to then take this on. Um, part of what we hope uh, is through, you know, if we sh we're going to evaluate it as well, and if we show the impacts we think are likely, that, um, that there will be some ways to think through the costs. Um, and, you know, we've talked to academic institutions and having students help. I mean, we're trying to figure out what's going to work best in each area. Through our formative work, the thing that's been clear is that the same general organization is not going to be the one doing this in every state, right? So like in one state, the health department is not viewed as, as objective, right? And so we would work with an outside policy shop. Uh, but yeah, our hope is for sustainability and that there will be funds that the actually legislature would allocate or um, in Maryland, for example, which is not one of the states, but we started doing work there a few years ago. They have a policy shop, and I, we talked about them taking it on. Um, but they talked about, no, I don't have anybody on staff who is like an MPH or understands social determinants of health. So we also have built in a peer review process, so that way you can get some outside perspectives on this. So um, you know, we're hopeful that it'll gain traction and continue on for a long time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll go here. Yes, ma'am. Is that the black? Yeah. Uh, so this is, I, I'm really in support of the idea of the health note, but mm -hmm. does it actually work, or do people still vote on party lines? I mean, have you actually changed people's minds with it? So I, so we haven't, so there was a, so no, no, it, because we haven't done this yet, this pilot. Oh, oh, but okay. we have, in Maryland, we did try this, and what I will say that we learned from Washington State is, um, from a reviewing their tool, which is very similar, is that this gives additional information, and we release these as part of um, uh, committee hearings. So it goes public testimony in a bill hearing. Clearly, people are still vote on party lines. Clearly, people still vote for based on what their constituents say or the, the fiscal note sometimes that trumps everything. Um, but I think what we're sort of learning is that people want the information. Advocates want the information to then advocate for their position. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful that this will give people one additional thing to think about. We're going to analyze it and evaluate it and see. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. We'll go to the back and then come back up here. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. It's yeah. all really exciting and I really, really like the health notes. So I have a question about in the health notes and also HIA generally, um, about how you deal with stress as, as an impact, right? So I think a strong case you can make most social policy is that we'll have some impact on stress. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's tough to quantify. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, I'm just, how do you, how do you deal with that? When do you decide to, you know, we're going to explicitly call this out as a health mm -hmm. impact versus not? Yeah. And how, what sort of metrics do you use? How do you kind of quantify this construct that's, you know, yeah. tougher to quantify than, you know, walking into something? Yeah, there's tremendous variation in practice. So of those 400 HIAs, a number of them have looked at mental health. 
There's actually a group of people in Chicago that have said we need to do mental health impact assessments to elevate mental health impacts. And really the, the way HIAs proceed is that you should be using the best methods that are relevant to whatever areas you're looking at. So if you're looking at mental health or stress or housing, we should be trying to measure these things in the way that's the best practice of our standards in the field. So I would just say that um, HIAs tend to use uh, literature reviews, some primary data collection and surveys. Some people will use existing national data sets or state data sets that include these metrics. Um, others will collect their own data, but most often people are using existing data. Um, uh, so I would say if you were to review all the med uh, how mental health is measured, you would see a ton of variation. Yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question about how kind of health notes, the role of it as it kind of becomes a more, well, hopefully a more widely used tool to kind of bridge this intersection and kind of conversation between policy, data, and, acad and the academic world. And I was kind of triggered or thought about this because of your, your comment about skills who don't, mm -hmm. maybe don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And one of the screening tools is that if there's no data mm -hmm. about that thing, then the bill can't really go anywhere. Mm -hmm. is, is there any, are there any plans to kind of like have a note to circle back to like, oh, we need data mm -hmm. for this? And the reason I'm asking is because there was recently a conference at MIT for, uh, called uh, Data for Black Lives. And one of the biggest things was about how the lack of communication on what data policymakers need and what data academics generate, there's yep. not this kind right. of like uh, overlap with it. And I feel like this could be a really interesting tool. Yeah. Like, we don't have data on this and this is what they need. How do we circle back to somehow create this data? Yeah, thank you so much. You know, your comment made me think of uh, Ross Bronson wrote this great paper several years ago, talked about travelers and parallel universes, academics and policymakers, right? Like I, I think about that all the time and you're absolutely right. We as researchers, many of us, actually I'm not gonna put myself now, many researchers do not talk to policymakers in terms of understanding the types of data that they need to inform decisions. I know people here do this work, uh, Jonathan does this work, uh, and so are thinking through um, uh, the types of things that, um, that we know policymakers want to know the answer to. In terms of the health note, I'll say two things. One, um, for if we move forward on a note, and when we do a note, we develop a conceptual pathway to show how this bill might affect health. If there's no evidence for a pathway, we will call that out and say, we couldn't tell you about this impact because we didn't have any data. And we think that that in and of itself is very powerful to then um, share with researchers or other public health stakeholders to say we need more data on these elements. The second thing is even, you know, sometimes we will do a health note even if we know the bill isn't gonna go anywhere because the bill will probably come back next year. You know, I think about legislation I worked on in Maryland related to medical marijuana. That bill was, promote, uh, was proposed like eight years in a row, right? And so we knew that what we were learning from this year would be able to come back up for next year. So we, I think there's still value in doing those even if the bill might not move forward because we know it could inform future work. Yeah. And I think that's what I was yeah. It's not just like, in not like just passing the bill, but like um, identifying what needs to be developed and, and how that can kind of mm -hmm. create the cycle for the foundation for it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, Jenna. Uh, this, is, this is all really great, and I think there are some people in our field who are um, better poised to be able to mm -hmm. handle some of this than others. And so, my question is um, kind of surrounds um, what types of programs or training or skills that you think a graduate program should be focusing on in order to kind of target mm -hmm. and create people who can actually mm -hmm. go and do some of these things. And, you know, you talk about organizations that maybe don't have people that are qualified mm -hmm. from the health side, mm -hmm. but also um, even there's you know plenty of people with MPHs that might not feel comfortable or, or qualified to even think about policy. Yeah. Um, myself included, mm -hmm. like, you know, I think about policy, but I'm like, that's, I have never made any Mm -hmm. uh, group of, of health practitioners. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll just, I'll just give you one example um, in the interest of time. Maybe we could talk more about this too at lunch. Is um, uh, at Hopkins, for example, one of the things that, that we do, I know our we have a policy curriculum where we have students who are learning skills around translational research, dissemination, science, um, policy communications. Writing is critical. 
you need to learn how to write for policymakers. Very different than writing a manuscript that has p-values and odds ratios. Right? So even that is very specific skill that we teach our students. And I would say jump in and get experience. I think you, I cannot underscore enough the value of experiential learning. And I would say I can think of so many policymakers who are clamoring for help from smart people who have limited budgets for staff and who, you know, I, we send students all the time to our local council and to our state government to do internships, to just help out and volunteer a day a week where they are getting so much out of being in that environment and providing a great service to the legislator. Um, we have, um, I uh, run a policy award where we have legislators on our selection committee. So I'm very intentional about making sure we're connecting with them and particularly to get the earlier question around that disconnect, are we, asking questions that they need the answers to to help really move policy forward. Yeah, so I think thank you. On that Sorry. <laughs> charge to all of us. Just help me thank our speaker. Thank you.